How's it going everybody? Andrew Robinson here, back at it with another Max MSP tutorial. In this video, we are going to talk about the JIT.gen object, which is one of my absolute favorite objects because it lets us do so much, so, so much in terms of creating visual art in Max MSP. However, one very thing uh, that's super important to note is that this object has a pretty steep learning curve. Um, and that's because it uses its own set of objects. So we're gonna break this JIT.gen tutorial series down into a little bit smaller chunks so we can go through all of these pretty systematically and figure out what they all do. So let's just jump right into it. First things first, we're gonna have to create a JIT.world because we're doing stuff with Jitter and we need a window to see whatever we're doing it. Um, as same, same as always, I'm gonna do at floating one, at FSA one, and at FS menu bar zero. These are great starting attributes to put in your JIT.world object. And once that's created, we get our window. It's gonna pop up right over here. I'm gonna press T to create a toggle, patch that into the JIT.world, lock the patch by holding down the command and clicking in the blank space, and then clicking the toggle. It's turned on, we see that's working because our JIT.world window background changed colors, so that means it's rendering, and now we can unlock the patch and continue editing. So next thing we're going to need is very basic. We're gonna need a JIT.gl video plane. We're gonna say at transform reset to, so that video plane reaches the edge of our JIT.world window, and we are all set up to send visuals into this window now. Um, so let's bring in this JIT.gen object. And JIT.gen um, is very special in how it works, not only because it has its own set of objects, but also because you have to lock the patch and then double click on it and it opens up this second window. This is called a sub patcher. We haven't actually talked about this very specifically, I don't think, um, which is unfortunate because it's a pretty basic concept of Max MSP. Um, I try to generally avoid them in the videos because it, it's just a lot of windows to deal with, but this is just how JIT.gen works. So you double click on it, it opens up this sub patcher, which is its own max patching window. And in this window, whatever we do, everything is going to be encapsulated inside our JIT.gen object. And you see by default, uh, what it has is an inlet one and an inlet two, and it just adds them together. So JIT.gen can do all of our basic jitter binary operations. It can add, subtract, multiply, divide, uh, modulo divide, you know, take the absolute difference, all of those things. And they're all very handy because uh, it creates a very compact way of doing all of those things if you need to do a bunch of them. It's like way easier than creating like four or five JIT dot plus and multiply objects out here in this window. And you know, just having a bunch of chains here, you can just do it all inside a JIT dot gen window and it's super compact as one object. So that's super helpful. Um, the other stuff um, is where it starts to get complicated because that's where we get into all the new objects and what those functions are. Um, let's take a step back real fast. We're going to close out of this window. We're going to go back to our main Max MSP window. And JIT.gen, in addition to, you know, just being a sub patch and having been created, it needs a jitter matrix to initialize it. This jitter matrix can be anything. It can be a JIT.matrix object, JIT.movie, like a movie file or an image file, or JIT.grab if you want to use your webcam. It just needs a jitter matrix. Um, and what it's going to do is adapt to that jitter matrix. So we're going to send JIT.matrix. We're going to create one. We're going to say three float 32. So we get three planes of data. That's just an RGB. We're ignoring the alpha. Float 32 works best for JIT.gen stuff because it's a normalized value. We don't have to think about integers. Everything makes a lot more sense and it's easier for the JIT.gen to compute whatever we're doing. And then we just do our normal dimension size stuff. I'm going to just say 100 by 100 arbitrarily. And if we patch this into the JIT.gen, our JIT.gen has now adapted to this jitter matrix. So this JIT.gen is now also being treated as a three flow 32, 100 by 100 matrix. And it's going to adapt to whatever you send in the left inlet. So if we had, you know, a matrix that's 640 by 480 in the left and this 100 by 100 in the right, it will be the 640 by 480. It's the left inlet that it adapts to. That's kind of important to remember. Um, but yeah, now that this is all set up, we can do whatever we want inside JIT.gen to create some visuals. So last, actually, last thing we need to do is just patch this middle outlet of the JIT.world into this matrix. So we get that bang from the uh, window refresh happening and that bang is going to come out this patch core into this matrix which is going to constantly pass this through the jit.gen um, into the video plane and we'll be able to see all of our visual updates so that's super super cool um, super easy and now we are ready to go back into jit.gen and start uh, messing around in here so the first thing we need to learn um, is that we don't actually necessarily have to pass our inlets to, uh, through 
to the outlet for this to work. We do if we want, you know, whatever this matrix is to come through. Like if it was a movie file and we wanted to add something visual to the pixels of that movie, you would, you know, keep that stuff together. But because we're just using a blank matrix and we don't actually care to use this blank matrix um, to do anything other than just initialize our jit.gen object, we can just leave this in one here unconnected and do stuff in here that's going to output. So the first thing I'm going to create is called a norm object. And you see it's a normalized coordinates of input matrices. And if we just patch that through to the out, this is what we get. Now, what this is is actually very, very specific. Um, we have a range of values going between zero and one um, across our X and our Y dimensions. So all the way over here at the left, uh, let's pick the top left corner, this teeny tiny pixel, it's black. And that's because it's uh, set to zero um, on the X and zero on the Y. And if we follow this across, you know, like as if it was a straight line, we are slowly increasing our value from zero to one, which is the ultimate, the final corner uh, over here and you see it's like super super saturated red and that's because our x-axis is acting as our red channel in this instance so we are going across the red channel from zero to one and when you have a one in your red channel like that is the r most red red you can create um, that is pure saturated red and then it works the same way on our y-axis, except that is acting as our green channel. So over here, back in the top left corner, it's zero there. And we move down this line to this corner where we get a one. And it is the most, because it's in the green channel, it is the most saturated type of green you can get. So if you think about it, then that's why diagonally over in this corner, it's yellow. It's because we have a one in our red channel and a one in our green channel. And a one in the red and green makes yellow. So that's why this corner is yellow and this looks like this. Um, we can even see this outside of just looking at the colors. If we go back into our main max patch and we create a jit.cell block object, which shows you uh, the values inside each pixel uh, in this nice cell format, we're just gonna patch the jit.giant into it and you'll see we now have uh, these boxes which you know equal our pixels and if we drag our bar over from left to right, you'll see it is going from zero up towards one. We're in point two now, point three, point four, point five, all the way up to that final corner being one. So this is just another very easy way to see exactly what we're getting out of this jit.gen. Um, and thinking of it this way might make more sense than my color explanation, but that, you know, both are very valid. This, it's just, this is the colorized version of what we're seeing here. Um, so that's super easy. Let's jump back into jit.gen because there's more than just the norm object, which uh, as we have stated is going from zero to one. Uh, we'll note that right there. But we also have the S norm object, um, which is cool because it goes, instead of from zero to one, it goes from negative one to one. Uh, and if we take the patch cord here and we move that over, you see that it is working. But um, it looks different because negative one doesn't represent any kind of color. If it's below zero, it's going to be black. So we have a whole lot of extra black space. In fact, we have black space from this negative one up to the center, which is zero. And then that's when we start to get into the positive integers. Um, and so we're slowly going over till we hit one again. And we can also see this is true because you see here in our jit.cell block, it's negative one at the left end. And then we move over closer and in the middle we hit zero. So that's like about there. And then we keep going all the way. And yeah, we see that one, which again is this super saturated right here, the green and the yellow um, respectively. So why are these objects so important? Um, it's really because jit.gen works at the shader level. Basically, the idea of jit.gen is you can like simply, you can very quickly and effectively do something that affects every pixel. That is kind of the idea of like what shaders are also. You're, it's like an algorithm that is generating something for every pixel. Um, and so S norm is just, you know, uh, this color representation from negative one to one, um, but we can use these to generate visual. So let's kind of like take a quick look at that. 
Um, and there's a lot of different ways we can do that. Um, the important thing to note with this is we have to use two more objects. Those objects are called Swizz and Vec. Now, Swizz and Vec, they have weird names, but these objects, thankfully, function very similar to the uh, unpack and pack object that we would use in our normal jitter window. Swizz being unpack and Vec being pack. And it's cool because we can unpack or pack things back together. Very easy, very simple to do. So if we just say, you know, Swizz zero, which is going to take the first plane of whatever whatever we patch into that, we can patch this S norm object into that. Um, and then maybe that, let's say into the red channel, because VEC is pack and you see it has three inlets. So this is like our RGB and we are patching it into the red channel and we're just gonna patch that out to our outlet. So now we are going from negative one to one, but only on the red channel. This doesn't have anything in the green or blue, so that's kind of why we lost that. And we can move this over and see that across all the different channels and different color combinations, and there's a lot of options you could do with that. Now, because we're taking from negative one to one, and like I said, anything below zero, it's just gonna be black, let's just throw an abs object in here, which gives the absolute value, so that will return our negatives as positives, and if we uh, patch the swizz through that and then to the vec, you'll see we are now positive one on this end and positive one on this end with, um, you know, zero being towards the center, which is pretty cool. We could even, I don't know, we could swizz out the Y dimension um, and pack that in. Uh, let's also send it through an abs and let's send it, I don't know, on the blue channel. And that's what it's gonna look like because now we're going um, on the Y direction instead of the X direction. And we've patched that Y direction of the snorm into the blue channel. So pretty easy. And again, you know, we're just, we're just generating random colors and things. Um, that we can use to make visual artwork. So very simple to start. Um, but, 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 jit.gen has so many more objects. This is just this is just the absolute most basic stuff we need to think about. Um, but we can still do more. And a very useful, very cool object um, is the param object. And what the param object does is you give it a name it can be anything you want. I'm going to say which. And then you could, if you wanted to, give it an initial value after. So I'm going to say zero. So this is, uh, we've just created this parameter, which, which by default will load in with zero. And what that does, after you create a param object, um, in our main max window, we can now add a message with that same name and patch it into our jit.gen. So we called it which, right? We can press M, create a message box, type in which. You see it also autofills and it says jit.gen parameter, which is cool. That's how we know this message is linked to this object. We're going to put our variable symbol in there, which is dollar sign one, patch that in there. And then whatever, you know, I pass through this message, like say an integer, it's going to work the same way um, as if you were sending a message to any other object in match, max. It's going, we could say which one, that which one is going to come through this patch cord into here, and this param object, even though we don't see it visually here, it updated from which zero to which one. Now, why am I doing that? Um, that is because we also have this awesome object in max, or in the jit.gen window, called selector which you know, functions very similar to the switch object um, in the main max window. Um, Jit.gen also has a switch object and a gate object. However, uh, a, w note, a thing to note about those objects is you only get a true or false value. So you only get two inlets with that. Selector lets you have multiple inlets. So we're gonna say something like select three and we're going to get um, the first inlet being which inlet to forward. So a integer value to say which inlet of these we want to send through the outlet. So let's just patch um, our stuff into it. We can patch the norm into here. Let's patch the uh, S norm into this one, and let's patch the this VEC object into the third one so we get all of them together. And then we're gonna patch that out to our out, and we're gonna patch the param into the leftmost inlet. So that message comes through and updates here. And it's not going to patch pass through the which part 
of the object. It's just going to pass through the integer. The which is just the name we are giving to it so it knows um, what, what message to look for. So now if we go back to our main max patch and we start changing these values, there we go. That's the S norm. That's our vec look. We go back to two, again back to the S norm. Then one, and that was our norm look. And if we go zero, it closes all of them so we don't get anything. That could also be very useful for a lot of different things. And this is it. This is a good start to looking at the jit.gen object and um, just the ways in which it's the same um, but also completely different. Uh, and there are so many more objects that we're going to talk about in future videos. Um, again, it's it's going to be broken up into a multi-part series just because there are so many objects um, to look at. Um, but what's super cool, what's super, super cool is there's a documentation file for this. So if we click on the search uh, tab icon and we go into jit.gen, we just type that in here. You see down here, it says documentation, uh, gen overview, gen common operators. Let's click the gen common operators. And it's gonna pull up this list of all of the operators that we can use inside jit.gen. So we have this handy reference list if we want to learn about other objects in gen and what they do. Um, and it does give you a description, so that is very helpful. But once you get used to that, like I said, everything else, it starts to become very, very similar. So hopefully that is helpful. Um, hopefully these starting objects of the Swizz and Norm and SNorm and Vec and what those do all make sense. Um, and once we get deeper into this, we're going to really see why these come in handy and are so useful. So that's going to be that. Um, thank you so much for watching. Uh, if you guys have any questions or comments, uh, remaining, please leave that in the comment section down below. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe because that's how I know that I'm doing a good job uh, and explaining these things to you guys. And I always really appreciate it um, a lot. So thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.